Cavalier Health. You have over seven years of experience in the regulatory arena, and your specialty is really helping your clients maximize coverage from CMS, which is, a, I know, a tiny part of your expertise, but we appreciate you speaking to us um, about that today. So join me in welcoming Jenny. build off what um, Jim Rollins um, um, was speaking about in terms of the national coverage determination and how you engage. So a lot of the questions that were being asked just now, I'll plan to dive into those a little bit further and actually give kind of the experience from working as a healthcare consultant with a lot of uh, manufacturers, patient advocacy groups uh, that want to know how to engage in the Medicare coverage process. So. Uh, as we just mentioned, I've been working for the past seven years in helping clients navigate the processes that were just discussed and really understand how do you write an effective comment letter? How do you reach out to the right people um, at Medicare so that your voice is heard? Um, and what evidence should you be bringing? So some of the, the slides I'll be presenting will look a little bit redundant, but I'll plan to kind of dive in on the specific sections um, and questions that were being raised around um, when is the right time to engage um, at the different points in the process that Jim Rollins identified, um, what evidence should you be bringing to Medicare, um, and what is the most effective. And since it's a you know a smaller group today, I feel free to jump in with questions or if I'm going too quickly. I really want to make this um, you know as informative as possible. Um, just as a show of hands, how many people have actually actively been engaged in the Medicare coverage process? Oh, actually a few. Uh, at the national level? Okay, perfect. Um, so I might even um, ask for some kind of thoughts in terms of what you've found to be best practices as I'm going through it. So in terms of presentation objectives, um, just to highlight them. One, increase your understanding of what the process is. I'll touch less on that since uh, Jim Rollins just went through it, but maybe I'll touch a little bit more on the local coverage process to give you a sense of what that looks like. Um, and then I'll specifically spend the most of my time um, answering the following questions. What are the engagement opportunities in the national Medicare coverage process? Where do you monitor Medicare coverage activity? So getting a little bit more granular as to how you look at these databases. Um, and then again, how do you optimize your engagement? And then I'll touch a little bit on um, when is it, like how do you think about the, the benefits and risks of engaging Medicare? Because it's often not always a, <laughs> like a good opportunity to march in uh, to the Medi Medicare's offices. Sometimes your, your product is getting covered um, and when you walk into Medicare's doors, it's more like uh, throwing a flare in the air, <laughs> essentially, and saying, look at my product, when you might actually be getting covered, and, and it might not be a good opportunity at that time uh, to engage with Medicare. So I won't touch on this, um, just to say that, as um, Jim Rowan said, really the overarching um, kind of guidepost for determining whether something is covered or not is if you're, quote, reasonable and necessary. And there's a long history of patient groups and a lot of stakeholders wanting Medicare to provide more detail around what that means <laughs> to be reasonable and necessary. And there are, as uh, Jim Rollins said, some things around improving health outcomes, generalizability to the Medicare population um, that are definitely guideposts, but there's really not a checklist <laughs> that to say, if you meet these six things, you will be covered. And the reason why there hasn't been that much pressure to you know, get the agency to articulate it is because the gray area can be a good thing. Because if you have a, a very black and white checklist, if you don't meet one thing, then you're not able to kind of make an argument for why you should be covered. And so that's why we've kind of stayed in this limbo area of just kind of reasonable and necessary. And so it's very much like a legal um, kind of process of looking at case precedent to understand Kind of in a similar type of cancer product or diagnostic, what were kind of the key clinical guidelines they looked at, or what were like the key pieces of evidence they looked at, and use that as a rubric for then understanding, well, this will be something that resonates the most with the agency, given that this was something that seemed to drive the decision when they considered a similar product. 
So one thing to keep in mind is that when we talk about Medicare's national coverage determination process and the local coverage determination process, we're talking about anything that is physician administered. So this isn't, uh, these aren't oral products that are managed under Part D as in dog. Uh, this is anything under Parts A and B. And um, so, and for one thing to, to keep in mind is um, with national and local coverage determinations, the coverage decisions are made at the class level. Um, so I might be getting a, like a, a little um, too foundational, but um, we're all familiar with kind of the FDA process and the approval decisions being made at a product level. And I think most people think that when you then come to market, that the coverage decision is also going to be at that product level. And it's not. <laughs> and that's important for a couple of reasons. So an example would be, um, right now, Medicare at the national level is looking at um, lung cancer screening. And so that decision is at, for all cancer screening tests, and specifically C low dose CT scans. But it's looking at all types of CT scans, not a specific manufacturer's version of a CT scan. And so why that's helpful to know is because it's important to understand what the existing landscape is for coverage, because even though you might be a new product, if there's something that's already out in the market, there might already be a coverage decision that you can kind of ride the coattails on, essentially. You don't need to kind of um, you know, shake the waters up because it's, you're actually getting covered and paid for. So as was mentioned before, but I'll just kind of hit on because it is a key, um, they are key points. Less than 5% of coverage decisions are handled at the national level. So if you go to the websites that I'll show at the end, there are only about 10 to 12 national coverage determinations each year. So just as all politics is local, all Medicare coverage decisions are local. The majority of coverage decisions are handled at the local level. So that's one thing to note. Another key thing to note is not everything has a coverage decision. And uh, kind of going back to a legal analogy, uh, typically that means is you're innocent until proven guilty with the <laughs> Medicare coverage decision making process. So as long as, I don't know if, who said it, but the coverage process and the coding and payment process, are big, they're very separate. So that's, um, you know, intentional because Medicare wants to specifically look at the evidence and just at the evidence and determine whether they should cover or not. And then they'll think about kind of what payment should be assigned or what code should be used to implement that policy. Or they could not even have a coverage policy and look specifically at what code do providers need to be using for an FDA approved product, what's the payment assigned to it, and there might not be a coverage policy that exists at all. When that happens, those claims flow through the system. Essentially, coverage policies are more intended to kind of have automatic kind of edits in the system. So that's one of the biggest reasons why it's important to understand what the, cover the existing coverage landscape is for a given product that you might be advocating for before you march into a local Medicare contractor's office or the Medicare National, is you might be getting covered. If there's no policy that exists, um, and there's no negative coverage policy that exists, then you're generally going to get covered. And so that is like a good baseline like step to, to make sure that you do before um, you can march into Medicare's office because you could be, you know, casting light on something that might not have sufficient evidence at this point, and so you want to wait until that evidence is there. Obviously that was discussed a lot, uh, making sure that you have the evidence and the data there. This just gives you a snapshot to kind of bring the visual home of the fact that the majority of activity happens at the local level. And I'll give you a uh, show a picture in just a little bit as to what that local landscape looks like <coughs> and who the kind of key players are. Um, but national coverage determinations, NCDs, that all happens uh, through the coverage and analysis group, which is where um, Jim Rollins sits. The local coverage determinations and articles are the policy tools that are used at the local level. And local coverage determinations are essentially the same thing as national coverage determinations, but at a local level. And then there are these things called articles that exist out there. And essentially they are 
uh, policy updates, coding guidance, uh, things that the local contractors will send out to providers to say, here's what, um, how you should be coding a specific project. Or even, um, this is something in a trend we've seen, more articles, and as you can see here, 70% of coverage activity comes through articles, will often say, you know, this is something that we do as investigational, and so we will be reviewing this on a case-by-case -case basis, and they've actually been using more and more almost as kind of pseudo coverage policy mechanisms. And the reason why they use them is because they don't have to go through the laborious task of having engagement, comment opportunities, and so they're definitely something that you should look to uh, for a lot of oncology products because um, they're a way for contractors to quickly get information out to providers about new products that are coming to market. So as um, Jim Rollins said, um, there are a number of different triggers um, to the Medicare coverage process in determining whether Medicare will internally generate a coverage request and also whether they will um, act on an external request. So anyone can submit a external request for a national coverage determination or a local coverage determination. A question that we often get is, is there like a repository <laughs> of all of the requests so that you can get a sense of what Medicare is considering? No. <laughs> um, essentially all you um, can look to to get a sense of, of what Medicare is acting on is once the tracking sheet has been posted and the train has left the station. There, is, um, there are some things that exist called potential national coverage determination lists. Um, but they are not updated regularly and something that I would not advise you could hang your hat on for what Medicare is um, looking at in the pipeline because the last time a potential national coverage determination list, which was meant to be kind of a here's a look at our crystal ball of things that we're looking at, last time it was updated was back in November of 2011. So it's something that they have said uh, a few times that they plan to update annually, but they haven't. And so I'll show a couple of sources that you can look to that we look to at Avalier as signals of what Medicare is thinking about acting on. Um, one of those is uh, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality's Technology Assessments. So Jim Rollins had said that oftentimes when they're looking at topics uh, and what, wanting to better understand, you know, is something, are there questions about clinical effectiveness? Are there questions about, um, you know, whether the standard of care is changing? They will often commission the Agency for Healthcare and Research and Quality to do a technology assessment, and all of those technology assessments are publicly posted. And they will post the ones that are kind of in the, in the pipeline and ones that are in progress. And so I will show the website where you can look at those. And I think there are a lot of ones right now up for genetic tests for various oncology conditions. And so that is a signal. It doesn't mean that Medicare will definitely act on those, but at least it gives you some sense that this is of interest to the agency. So the local coverage determination process. So this is a lovely map of how uh, Medicare breaks up uh, the country in terms of local jurisdictions. And there are a lot of um, terms that I'll throw around in kind of an alphabet soup, but so local coverage determinations, LCDs, um, MACs are Medicare administrative contractors. Essentially, they are uh, the contractors that bid to um, issue and kind of control and oversee um, the various jurisdictions um, around the country. There are, Medicare's in the process of consolidating the country to 10 different regions. And as you can see here, there are a couple contractors, each color represents a different contractor that oversee a couple regions. The reason why, and my husband <laughs> does not understand why, um, if you're in, say, Washington, something could be covered, but if you're in Texas, you might not be covered um, if there isn't a national coverage determination. The reason why, as we mentioned up here, that Medicare has made it this way is because there are various local market needs, and by kind of leaving things to the local level, 
um, you're able to be more nimble and responsive to kind of local market needs. So whereas if diabetes is more of an issue in a specific part of the country, the contractor there is able to develop policies um, that are better kind of, kind of mapping to what their uh, patient population looks like. It makes it really hard to navigate if you are a patient or especially are a national organization and you're trying to understand why is like a patient in California um, getting covered for this treatment um, and a patient in North Carolina is not. And so normally the way that we do our coverage assessments is to look at the national level. There's a coverage database that exists. You can type in um, you know, a specific product, see if there's a national coverage determination. If there's not one, then you move down to the local coverage database. And you can look to see if there are policies in each of these regions. And this is a helpful map, and you'll have this in your folder, for being able to say, OK, this says Cigna has this policy for jurisdiction. Um, the colors are actually on the slide. I don't know why they're not showing up here. So you will actually be able to see where they go. Um, say uh, Meridian has a policy in California. You'll be able to know exactly you know, that Palmetto is, is linked to California and understand kind of where that is being mapped. Is there a question? Yes. So we have a situation where we got um, in, uh, in in the LCD area F and H. Okay. We've got a, a, some a policy change that a coverage policy change that appears to have taken place as of January first. But it, we are not finding evidence of that in other regions. So those are pretty big geographic areas. So the question is. From a perspective of an advocacy organization, does it make more sense to try to tackle something like that at the local level, or does it make more sense to to go to CMS and, and try to address from a national level? Great question. Um, local is where you want to go. So national um, definitely gives a lot of autonomy to the local Medicare contractors to do their thing, um, and until something kind of bubbles up from the local Medicare contractor, like National Medicare is not going to really look at it. Um, and I, really the, the main thing uh, that Jim Rollins has mentioned is when there's a lot of variation in local coverage. Like variation is uh, something that is very much status quo. And so it really has to be a great deal of variation where National Medicare will say, this is something that it looks like a lot of different policies are being developed on this and no one's coming out with the same answer. We should take this up at the national level. Um, it's very common to have um, coverage policies at the local level that aren't in sync. So I would definitely recommend if you have policies that are not favorable for your product, um, there are, uh, for the oncology community, groups called the CACs. And I'll talk about this on the next slide. Actually, our concern is not a product, but a surgical procedure that's being denied. OK. Well, it's the same thing, actually. So uh, depending on, this is, let me just jump to the next slide. So the contractor advisory committees, or CACs, are a very influential group within um, kind of the, the local Medicare uh, environment. And essentially, what their role is is to be a link between provider community, the local provider community, and the Medicare contractor um, that's issuing these coverage policies. And there are, if, you, if the procedure is in the oncology realm, there are oncology CACs. So there are CACs for specific expertise or therapeutic areas. And ASCO actually has on their website, you can go on and just type in to Google ASCO oncology CACs and you can pick find and identify the oncology CACs in, uh, that are relevant for, say, Region F or Region G. And I would suggest reaching out to them and saying, here's um, what the issue is, um, here's kind of why we believe this is something that should be covered or something that's been misunderstood, and have them be your advocates with you. Because they have relationships with these local Medicare contractors rather than just sending in a letter. Uh, and I would use that. If you find obstacles there, then that's where you can go and uh, have a direct conversation with the Medicare contractor, but um, they are there for a reason um, and are a formal part of the local Medicare coverage process. Let's go back. 
So this is an overview of what the local Medicare coverage process looks like. Um, the national process that we'll touch on briefly is nine to 12 months. The local process is a little bit shorter, six months. Um, and it's all very public, similar to the, the national process. Um, it's, um, statute requires it to be so. Um, and there are opportunities um, both to, if you look at the light blue box in the middle, that's where the process starts. Similar to uh, the national process, you will see kind of what the local contractor is looking at. There will be an opportunity at a public meeting uh, to you know, make comments about a specific product. Um, and so that's an opportunity for advocates um, to get up and talk. Then the issue is presented to the contractor advisor committees. And that's why it's helpful to you know, talk to them and also develop a relationship with them. I think one of the things that um, we often find is, and not surprisingly, when something's wrong is when you immediately engage with someone. But it's helpful if you can you know, have these people be your advocates to say, you know, these are the issues that really matter to us, and we definitely want to be a partner with you and want you to like, better understand what are the outcomes that are important to our patients, and so make sure that they're helping you to keep you in the loop as to what's going on. So the issue is presented to the, the, uh, the CACs, then a draft local coverage determination um, is developed. They post that for public comment, and um, then from there they post the public comments and then they finalize the local coverage determination. And all of that is very public um, in terms of being able to track what local coverage determinations are up for public comment, um, and when certain public meetings are being held. It is difficult to navigate because there are 10 of them, <laughs> um, but if you go on, and I'll show you Medicare coverage, the Medicare coverage website, you can um, track them all in one place, which is helpful. So I'll move through this. I, I think the one key point to highlight here is in terms of the type of evidence that resonates with the local coverage um, in the, at the local coverage level. Uh, obviously, clinical guidelines, systematic reviews, published literature, um, but unlike the national coverage policy process that just looks at published literature, we'll talk about it a little bit more uh, later on, uh, the local Medicare coverage process will also look at unpublished literature. So I know, especially for a lot of oncology treatments, uh, the evidence just might not be published yet if they're very new. Um, products and so that is something that's helpful to know that that information will actually be considered um, by those local Medicare contractors. So now for the national coverage determination process. So um, this just gives you a sense of kind of where the Center for Clinical Standards and Quality Group sits within the very uh, kind of convoluted structure of CMS. Uh, this is what um, Sherry Wing oversees, and the coverage analysis group sits with, under the Center for Clinical Standards and Quality. There are three um, groups that sit with, uh, under the coverage analysis group. Um, the whole coverage analysis group, or CAG, is led by Tamara Syrick Jensen. She's the current acting director, and some of you may have been familiar with Louis Jacques. Um, who used to be the director, he no longer works at CMS, and so Tamara, until um, a replacement, or she's officially named, um, the director is the acting director. And she is the person that if you, there is a negative coverage determination or you have an issue with uh, a current uh, coverage determination, she's the person to go to first uh, with setting up a meeting or reaching out to engage. Um, she is a JD. Uh, she is not a, you know, does not have clinical expertise. And I think that's important to know when you go in to talk to CMS. Not all of them are going to be experts in your specific therapeutic area. And so it's important to, like I said, share that information in advance of the meetings so that they can better determine who they need to bring uh, from within the agency that might have oncology expertise. But it's also helpful from your perspective in knowing okay, maybe we should bring in you know, a practicing doctor or someone that has an expertise so that they are there to answer very specific questions because 
Um, I've been in a number of meetings where that expertise is assumed and it's created problems in terms of understanding um, in the presentation. Um, there are three groups that sit under the coverage analysis group and they're essentially segmented by uh, the items and devices, which is probably the, the key group that you would be interfacing with, the so Jim Rollins. Uh, so all physician administered drugs, non implantable devices, laboratory diagnostic tests. Um, Lori Ashby is the other key group that you're probably be interfacing with. She deals with medical and surgical services. And so she is responsible for any um, national coverage determination on you know, anything related to a surgical procedure uh, or implantable devices. So when you're reaching out, like Tamara is definitely the key person uh, to have on the email, but it's often helpful to also CC or include or make a letter specific to um, who the director is of the pertinent group. And then the last group is the operations and information management group, and they are responsible for convening MedCap meetings, which are uh, Medicare evidence development and coverage advisory committees. And I'll talk a little bit about what they are, um, but they oversee that <coughs> as well as oversee um, kind of like the horizon scanning process for uh, the Medicare coverage decision making process. So making sure that the other analysts are aware of new evidence that's coming out or um, areas where they might want to request an NC or internally generate one. This is the standard slide that you just saw from Jim Rollins of what the national coverage determination process looks like. Um, I think the, the key points to note, again, are when the engagement opportunities are. So when the national coverage request is formally accepted, a tracking sheet will be posted to say, we've decided um, to um, actually generate a national coverage determination on this issue. Um, once that is posted, there's really no going back. Uh, there are very few instances where I've seen Medicare say, just kidding, uh, we're going to take this down. Um, and so normally when that is posted, you can be ready for a 9 to 12 month process. And that's one of the reasons why, given how public the process is and how high the stakes are, at the end of this process, there's a national coverage determination that's binding on that whole map that I just showed. Um, and so. Again, if something is currently being covered um, and potentially might not have a coverage decision, but again, it isn't until proven guilty, it's important to make sure that you're really assessing the evidence before you get on this very high stage. Um, at the national coverage request, um, once it's posted and the tracking sheet is up, there's an opportunity for public comment. The evidence that is most helpful to Medicare at that time are um, information around what are the appropriate endpoints and outcomes. Um, especially from the patient advocacy groups, I think being able to say, I mean, I know a lot of the anecdotal evidence that uh, was mentioned up here is, it's obviously not weighted as heavily as, you know, information that's in the, the published literature, but if you can like connect and create a narrative for saying, here are why these endpoints are important, and here are studies where, um, you know, these endpoints have been evaluated, that is helpful for setting the scope of what the Medicare coverage decision looks like. So what endpoints are they looking at in the clinical literature and which ones are they using to assess kind of the benefits and risks of a specific technology? Um, or if there are nuances around a specific therapy um, that you don't think Medicare will, you know, will be top of mind. Those are all important uh, comments to make at the very beginning. Obviously, once a draft decision is posted, um, commenting directly on what the coverage decision has to say and why you agree or don't agree with it. And I'll talk a little bit more about what letters look like and some specific components you should include in a little bit. But um, like these are probably the, the, the biggest opportunities to comment. Sometimes Medicare will also request an ARC technology assessment. And um, this is an opportunity to comment directly on the technology assessments that are posted and how the evidence is reviewed. And when the our technology assessments are not always requested, so when they are, that is a key piece of evidence that Medicare uses to inform their decision making. 
and oftentimes they're requested before this whole process starts, which is why it's so important, uh, even if an ARC technology assessment doesn't always lead to a coverage determination, to comment on it if something is uh, not being adequately evaluated. And then MedCAC meetings are these public um, evidence advisory uh, committee meetings where there's a roster of 100 experts that are actually publicly nominate. There are certain opportunities that uh, patient advocates can actually nominate someone to be the patient or, or consumer advocate on the panel. And so that is an opportunity to just be a part of like the CMS process. And there are normally about 15 um, experts that are chosen for each meeting. And at the, that meeting, they will answer questions around the generalizability of the evidence in the Medicare population, or whether there are, is evidence that a therapy um, improves or meaningfully improves health outcomes. Uh, and every MedCAC meeting is required to have a patient advocate. And so that is an opportunity that when a MedCAC meeting is called on a specific product, and actually the coverage decision that's open on lung cancer screening, there was a MedCAC meeting. Was anyone at it from with, in this group? Uh, perfect. So at that meeting, there is a patient advocate. And I'm not sure who was the patient advocate that was called, but I don't think there are, there's a significant amount of oncology expertise on the MedCAC. There are only a few uh, patient advocates to choose from, from the roster. And so that is an opportunity, once a MedCAC is called, to engage that patient advocate that has been listed on the roster to explain to them, here are you know, the important endpoints that you know, are valuable to us. And here are the key things, of, like you know, our talking points as to why this is something that we believe um, you know, should be covered despite some evidence gaps. Um, and I found that valuable. I've been on a lot of calls where on behalf of clients who've educated um, you know, panelists that have been called for um, the MedCAC just to make sure that they have a sense of the evidence and of the therapy before the, the MedCAC is actually held. Um, this slide just depicts um, kind of the key channels of evidence that are considered. Clinical trials, again, it has to be published. There was a cover decision back in 2005 on implantable cardiac defibrillators and the manufacturer um, came to CMS and said, we would like this to be covered. And so Medicare uh, you know, went ahead and opened the decision and then found out there was no published evidence. And so it was actually, that was one of the few times that the coverage decision was closed prematurely because there was no evidence for them, or published evidence for them to consider, only unpublished evidence. Um, CMS looks at health technology assessments, so from ARC, but also internationally. Um, if you, since a lot of times oncology products uh, or any products are first brought to market in say the UK uh, or in Canada, uh, Medicare will often look at technology assessments uh, from those agencies to inform their decision making. So if there's a positive review of a product um, in, internationally, you, that is a key piece of evidence to cite in your comment letters because it is something that I review these things like a nerd, uh, and that is uh, something that is cited in all the coverage decisions are all those international technology assessments. Clinical guidelines, obviously, MedCAC recommendations, and then real-world evidence. So this speaks to the questions of generalizability to the Medicare population, and generalizability to uh, like community settings. So one of the key things that we've seen in Medicare coverage decisions is there is uh, you know, a very a highly technical procedure that has amazing evidence in randomized controlled trials. And then Medicare will look at it and say, there's no evidence that if any Joe Schmo provider does this, that they're going to be able to replicate those same findings. And that is an area where I'll just uh, get into this in a bit, where Medicare has said, uh, we want additional evidence to be collected. Um, and we are going to make coverage contingent on additional evidence collection. And that has been probably the number one reason that Medicare has issued um, what Jim Rollins had mentioned our coverage with evidence development decisions. So they want to know, like, yes, it has stellar evidence. And there have been a lot of comments that say, 
there are no evidence gaps here. <laughs> this is something that should be covered undeniably. And Medicare will come back and say, yes, the evidence um, has been great in randomized control trials, but we're not convinced that um, it's, it's necessarily generalizable to you know, rural settings that might not have the high-tech equipment to be able to do this or the training necessary to read, say, a low-dose CT um, cancer screening. And if you're at the MedCAC meeting, that was a key um, question and evidence gap that was highlighted at that meeting to say there's a huge randomized control trial uh, supporting the evidence for a United States Preventative Services Task Force recommendation. And Medicare essentially, or the Medicare panel, got up there and said, but it's, we don't know if this um, will actually work in the real world setting. If providers will be able to read these scans and then actually make a decision based on that. Um, at the end of that nine to 12 months, um, there is a final decision. It can either be national coverage, which means that the coverage is completely aligned with the FDA label. This happens very rarely, uh, which is an important point to, to understand as you're thinking through whether it um, behooves you to go to Medicare and request an NCD. Since there are so few of them, Medicare is normally opening national coverage determinations on topics where it knows it needs to kind of ref refine the parameters more so than um, the FDA label. And so the majority of coverage decisions actually fall in the center here um, with national coverage with restrictions, which means FDA label plus a lot more things. So a provider has to have this expertise. The therapy needs to be delivered in this type of facility um, with you know, the Joint Commission accreditation. Coverage with evidence development, which makes coverage contingent on participation in a clinical trial or a registry, or sometimes both. Um, and essentially, uh, one kind of myth to bust here with coverage with evidence development is it's, in, ideally, it's a great concept. If something is viewed as promising, um, which um, I would say for a lot of oncology treatments, if you went through um, the FDG PET and uh, positron emission tomography, this was something that was um, a huge uh, case study for um, the coverage of the evidence development process. People look at this and say, here's a way to get evidence collection paid for. Just go to CMS. Yeah, we're not, like there are evidence gaps here. They'll just give me a CED decision and we'll be done with it. We'll be able to collect that evidence. All that is covered within a CED decision is the product and some like routine like costs not the cost of doing a huge trial and collecting that evidence, not the cost of putting together and building an actual registry. And so a lot of trials, and actually the colorectal cancer drugs, there was a CED decision back in 2005, and they required um, CED through clinical trials. If you look at that decision, I think there are only two or three clinical trials that are up and running. Um, the decision is still CED right now. And so it's, it's really hard to kind of get the investment um, you know, from the provider community or from the manufacturers, because um, a lot of times they are the ones that are footing the bill for the CED. And so it's something that if CED is the, you know, the way that you think the agency um, will move towards, that you actually have a plan in place for what could be that, that registry that is utilized. So we actually do a lot of work um, at Avalier on that, is if there are evidence gaps and we are seeing Medicare move in this direction, what is a registry that could be leveraged? What is a clinical trial that could be leveraged? Um, because if you also want a clinical trial that's big, because essentially what CED is saying is only patients that are receiving care in this clinical trial will get coverage. <coughs> Um, I'll quickly uh, touch on this. This is just what a national coverage determination looks like. Um, you will get a benefit category that everyone's been talking about, inpatient, say, hospital services. There will be a description of the item, and then there will be the actual coverage language that will say um, whether 
something is going to be covered nationally with restrictions and then specification of what those restrictions are. This just gives you a sense of um, the growing number of coverage with Evans development decisions. Uh, and Jim Rollins had mentioned this before, um, but we're seeing you know, many decisions. So of the 10 to 12, there are um, decisions that come out each year. In some cases, like 2012, more than half of them have ended in coverage with Evans development. And if I was a betting woman, I would say that the lung cancer screening would probably end in coverage with Evans development which should be coming out the draft decision um, later on this fall. Um, this is um, just a higher level overview of some of the concerns with coverage of Evans development. And this is probably the biggest thing that we get questions from clients on is, well, why would we do coverage of Evans development? And normally the only place where we say coverage of Evans development is a good idea is when the alternative is not coverage. The reason why is one, like I said, it can be financially burdensome um, in terms of doing these registries and doing these clinical trials. Two, CMS does not typically set timelines for how long the evidence collection is, is going to go for. So we always say like CD is um, somewhat equated with like a limbo. You just, uh, once you get CD, you can just have it for, for many, many years. So there are, uh, I would say, a handful of CD decisions, and there haven't been too many. Um, that are, were established in 2005, and now almost 10 years later, they're still going on. Um, and so that's something that if something is getting CUD, you want to make sure that there is a set timeline for Medicare in terms of we'll collect evidence for three years, and this is why that's a you know, valid timeline, and then that's when we want CMS to reconsider it. And then there have also been a lot of concerns around like the nine to 12 time, 12 month time frame doesn't allow sufficient time for determining what's the right design, what endpoints are being evaluated. And so a lot of decisions have been established and then there's been a lot of tweaking on the back end um, that just created a lot of headache. Key point here is that professional societies are very influential with Medicare. So if you have a good relationship with a professional society, um, they are a good partner to have um, with Medicare coverage for patients. So I know I'm almost up on time, but this is, just gives you a sense of some examples of where professional societies have been very influential. These are the key questions that Medicare asks when developing an NCD. Most of these are very straightforward, so I'll let you review these um, when the slides are posted. Um, here's the key evidence Medicare uses to answer these key questions. So all the things that I mentioned before. And the reason why national coverage determinations matter quite a bit is they're all public. So private payers often use them to inform their own decision making or as cover for maybe choosing not to cover something. Main three key engagement opportunities. You can request an NCD be opened or reconsidered. You can get early input on a clinical trial design, and that's something that Medicare has uh, requested quite a bit of. And then three, you can respond to open comment opportunities. I've been harping on this, so I will let you just read this on your own time, but these are just some caveats as to why um, requesting an NCD might not always be um, the best way to go. Uh, we provide information on here around where you can get specific um, information on what components need to be in a request letter, if that's something that you decide um, to go forward with. Um, what are the key opportunities to meet with CMS prior to launch of a product that um, you can get their input on? And why it's valuable to, to meet with CMS prior to launch. And this is something that Medicare actively encourages uh, patient groups, manufacturers um, to meet with CMS so that they can better understand the product that they might be considering. Everything has risks. Um, you're putting something on Medicare's radar if you meet with them beforehand, so it's just important to understand um, that you are doing that when you're meeting with them. But um, if it's something that is very likely to be on their radar because it's a high cost product, say like Provenge when it came to market, um, or uh, 
there's already an existing ne negative coverage determination, you really can only go up. <laughs> so it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's valuable to meet with the agency. Um, this are just some things that we have here in terms of um, kind of a rubric for you to use in determining whether to engage CMS or not. And some risks to just think about. Where you can monitor NCD activity and actually sign up for um, getting you know, alerts pushed to you around coverage activity, when med techs are, where you can actually look at the ARC technology assessments that I mentioned before. Um, and then, again, more links to just find all the stuff that I've been talking about before. People already harped on this in terms of what should be in your comment letters. Evidence, evidence, evidence. Um, this is just more information about that. And just some key takeaways that you should know in terms of you're going to remember seven things about the Medicare coverage process. Um, these are them. So most of this stuff, again, is information that you can read and it's very straightforward. But if there are questions, um, happy to you know, receive emails or answer anything or when the break happens, uh, feel free to approach me. Thank you very much.